Um, just to give you a head, just to give you the heads up, we are recording this, but uh, don't worry, we're not going to use it against you in any way. Uh, we're just recording it later to have on our community platform, which. If you haven't already joined, please do. It's great. It's got a lot of content on there. So if you haven't already, please join that. I'll maybe talk a little bit more about it towards the very end. Um, good afternoon. I have to think what time it is. It is the UK here where I am. It's also the UK where our speaker, Jan Vishar, Dr. Jan Vishar, is joining us from. So uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Well, it's it's almost like the Eurovision Song Contest, but um yeah, welcome to uh, the, welcome to this session. We're over the moon to have uh, Dr. Janvi Shah speak for us uh, for the next hour seventy five minutes. Um, Janvi is actually going to be at the mainstream event in August, so we're really really pleased that she is coming out to that, and uh, she's bringing a family, so it's going to be a big holiday for the whole of the Shah clan. So that's great as well. Um, Jambi is going to be talking about improving asset management capability from her significant uh, background in working with the Highways Agency and very, very recently with the Birmingham City Council, which is the biggest in Europe, uh, the biggest council in Europe. Um, the great news that she has had in the last couple of weeks is that she's got a huge job working for a company called Arcadis who are also based in Australia as well and, and uh, have a global reach. You probably know them. So uh, congratulations to her. But um, over to you, Jamvi. Enjoy, folks, and uh, we will check in with you towards the end of the session. If you have any questions at all, put them in the notes or in the, uh, in the chat. And, uh, yeah, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Good morning, everyone, and I hope you all can hear me okay. So um, thank you for the brilliant thanks again. Uh, thank you for the grand introduction and that's that's uh, already a great start to the morning here on Thursday on uh, in the UK. Um, so I'm Dr. Janvi Shah. I'll start sharing my slides and then I'll take you through a little bit of what I will cover in this session today. So let me try and get the technology working, which is most important. Are you able to see my screen? I won't be able to we see can. you. So if you can, yes. yeah, brilliant. Yes. Okay, fantastic, yes. fantastic. So over the next hour or so, what I want to talk about is how asset intensive organizations, uh, so any organization who's got assets, uh, you know, physical assets uh, that they manage, they maintain, they operate, uh, or simply create, or they look after the entirety of that life cycle. Any organizations can apply these, uh, you know, these tips or, or, you know, these challenge, they have similar challenges and they can also see similar opportunities. So hopefully during this masterclass, what you'll be able to see is some similarities, some synergies with what you are seeing in your own organization, or you may have experienced during your own professional career working within the asset management space. Uh, and of course, I want to bring to life some real examples. And I've used National Highways as an example. So uh, and I'll talk about what National Highways does, which was formerly called as Highways Agency, Highways England. It's had a few names, but it's the same organization. So I'll talk a little bit about that, bringing to life some real examples. Um, as Ian mentioned, uh, I am a chartered engineer with experience in engineering and asset management. I've worked for the last 14 to 15 years um, uh, in the highway space predominantly. And I started as a a graduate geotechnical engineer. I love, I love my soil, I love my rocks and the earthworks, et cetera. Um, and then gradually, when I started to do a lot of feasibility studies and value management, I realized that actually engineering has got a very strong connection with economics in terms of how we think about designing the right thing, but also making sure it's in the right cost uh, it's the right, it's having the right sustainable outcomes, and ultimately it's providing the right service to the customers. So infrastructure is one of the biggest backbone for any country to provide the service to its customer, be it the, the road users, rail users, freight users, whatever that might be within, within the transport arena. And then I gradually moved into asset management space, having done my PhD in resilience in asset management. And when I started to work with local uh, government, I started to work with the national government here, I started to work with the Department for Transport, I soon recognized that asset management is a lot of common sense. <laughs> and you will also have felt this in your career, I'm sure, to say, actually, 
it is a science, it is an art, it is about bringing all of the good practices from the engineering lens, the economic lens, the social value aspects, but putting it all together in a coherent way through a systematic approach as, as, as is rightly defined um, to be able to provide the right outcomes at the end. And that excited me to get into the space of change and transformation. So I moved into uh, uh, one of the big four organizations, KPMGs, where I learned about and I worked on many, many sectors and many, many uh, organizations, uh, which was outside the infrastructure, a transport arena as well. So with Ministry of Justice, I did a project there with British ports. I did a project there with Network Rail. And that allowed me to see the concept of asset management with the business lens. Now, this was slightly new, moving from an engineering aspect to the economic aspect to now seeing things from a business lens. And that is fundamentally important, I think, as we evolve within the space uh, of asset management, um, that how can we actually talk in a language that makes, uh, that, that describes the value of doing the right asset management at the right time to the right assets, uh, managing the risks effectively, but in a sense that we can communicate to our shareholders, to our stakeholders, and through change and transformation, we can truly measure those outcomes. So a little bit of what I'll talk about is bringing some of those experiences to life using one or two case studies, of course, but this is all about sharing my own personal experience. This is not about be presenting as National Highways or as KPMG or as uh, Arcadis or as uh, Birmingham uh, City Council. It's more about bringing all of my own personal experience today to talk to you about and listen to you at the end through your chats to say how much of that resonates, how much of that was similar in your part of, of the world or, or not. Uh, and ultimately bringing all of this, I am a visiting lecturer at the University of Birmingham to share exactly these things, the practical experiences of being an asset manager, being an engineer, and actually working with a diverse set of stakeholders uh, from operators, inspectors, maintenance engineers, reliable, um, uh, resilience teams, emergency planning teams, and senior stakeholders, including the C-suite. And how do you translate, go into the depths of engineering and then pull the information out and explain it in a strategic sense with so what does it mean for the organization? Okay, so a lot of what I'll bring today will be similar, will, will be bringing to life some of that information. So in the presentation today, what, I'm, what I have summarized essentially, what I've tried to structure our masterclass is to talk about these five things that you see on the screen. One is about what is an effective asset management organization? Often we hear, uh, you know, uh, the public, obviously, public or private sector, either way, regulated or non-regulated sectors, whatever that might be, if they're operating, owning, managing assets, they are asset management for the context of this uh, presentation. What does a good effective asset management organization look like? Um, and some of these things you may be able to relate to your organization. Some of them you might think we are way off. This is not, this is good, but we don't do this yet. But that is exactly what we want to do, set the scene. Second is, so, so how do we develop a common understanding for what does asset management mean? We'll talk a little bit about what are the success factors for making an effective asset management organization. And I must say, having worked with a diverse set of clients, both public sector, private sector, as a consultant, as an asset owner in different uh, hats that I've worn, I've realized that there is no silver bullet and there is no perfect. This is it. This was been a perfect asset management organization. I haven't seen them uh, yet. But the beauty of this is that it's a journey and lots of organizations are at different stages in their journey. And the matured and effective organization is one that recognizes where they are on that journey and where they want to go. And this presentation will bring some of that, uh, it will make it a bit more clear. And ultimately I'm spending an, a, a predominant part of my presentation explaining the case study of National Highways where they were on this journey and how they evolved, how they matured their capability and what were the great lessons to take from uh, you know, that, that particular asset management uh, uh, journey, that improving the capability, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end, of course, I will give five key takeaway messages. So that summarizes all of this hours knowledge and you know, information in what are those five takeaway messages for you to take back? Okay, so let's begin. <clears throat> Characteristics of an effective asset management organization. Now, obviously I'll talk about it from a more academic sense in the next slide, but first I, I thought, hang on, if I look back at the last 15 years, what do I think are, what, what stands as an effective asset management organization? And for me, 
like I said, it's not somebody saying this is perfect. We've got every process, everybody's knows asset management, every, uh, you know, we've got the perfect system, perfect data. I don't think that exists uh, really. I think a good asset management organization is has these five traits. First, it has a common understanding of what asset management means to its own organization. So it's to its own people, whether it's a team, whether it's an organization of 500 people, 5,000 people or 50,000 people, but everyone in that organization, the people, their staff, their stakeholders, their shareholders, and probably even their customers are aware that what does asset management mean for this organization? Is it about is it about physically looking after the assets in a way that it is safe? It is uh, giving the best value for money um, providing the right outcomes to the customer and is measuring those performance effectively could be as simple as it's a means to an end to provide uh, our service to the customers or it could be as simple as we've got five big depots and we want to make sure that those depots are uh, you know in 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 most effective performance um, or we've got these 10 amazing technical standards and everybody follows these technical standards to uh, the word uh, of course that's not it's not one fits all, but I'm giving you an example that everybody believes and has a common definition of what asset management means to them, their people. Now, another aspect is regulators. So I'll talk a little bit about this. Whilst it's important that the staff and the stakeholders and the shareholders are aware of what asset management is or what journey the organization is, it's very important if it's a regulated sector, and even if it's a monitored organization, to have that rapport and that relationship, to have that understanding shared with the regulator because like everything, it's about setting expectations. It's about knowing that this is what good looks like for us. Yeah, so an effective organization is one where this is clearer uh, with, with all of the, its people. Second thing is that there is a way, a defined way of measuring benefits and outcomes. So that organization, this ideal theoretic, uh, the, the ideal hypothetical effective organization I talk about, they have recognized that we are an asset management company or an organization. We are on this journey. And this is how we are going to measure what is the benefit good asset management brings to us. Not because, not just because ISO says it, not just because our asset management strategy says we are supposed to do asset management, not just because our fantastic leader, our, our CEO is very committed to asset management. Sure, all of this is important, but what is exactly the benefit I'm going to get by doing good asset management? reduced risk, better customer outcomes, better value for money. Okay, great. That's meant, that's my outcomes and benefits, but how am I going to measure it? Because remember what gets measured gets done. So for me, I think this is really important that by doing asset management, it is not just a norm. It has got actually a business benefit, an organizational benefit, a benefit to your customer, a benefit to your performance, economic benefits, whatever that might be. And I've also learned in the last few years that sometimes there may be non-monetary benefits. If the organization is not in set up in a way that doing good asset management has direct uh, monetary benefits, sometimes they can be non-monetary benefits, but still they are very important outcomes, social outcomes. Um, they can indirectly contribute to financial outcomes and so on. So having that clarity of what's in it for us as an organization and how are we going to measure it so we can try see whether we are doing better or maybe our performance has dropped and what do we need to do? That mechanics super important. The third trait of an effective organization in my view is where there is a common North Star. And this is super important because uh, having the clear vision, again, it's not a vision that is nicely written in a glossy document sitting somewhere on your intranet, but something that everybody can align to. Every action aligns to it. So what does good look like for this organization when it means asset management? That's the common North Star and we all move towards that. Now, it may not be the perfect thing, the great thing that, you know, but it has to be well-defined. Otherwise, very often we end up in a situation where the organization is doing too many amazing things, but the sum total does not contribute together to achieve one single direction. It's all over the place. It's all moving in 15 directions, uh, but not cohesive with each other. So it's not enough to have that understanding, measure all the great things you're doing in asset management. If you don't know, Ultimately, how does all this come together? Yeah. Uh, the fourth, it's by no means, uh, you know, this is not in a, in a ranking order in any way, uh, is super strong leadership. 
and this is important because I, I strongly, I've seen asset management is done two ways, top down and bottom up. Both of them are important. You cannot just have leadership talking about it, but the team not bought in and you know everybody doing their own things in silo. But at the same time, it's equally worse when a lot of, um, I'm going to say eager, enthusiast, and people with the heart in the right place, as they say, are doing absolutely right things for the assets, managing their risks, keeping their costs uh, in check, making sure that there is value for money. But ultimately, it's not cohesive with a golden thread, with a strong mandate and clarity from the leadership team. Because a lot of time, these results in false starts. So it means lots of things start, but they never see the end of that particular journey. It's never embedded because it lacks that strong buy-in from the leadership team, a very good sense of ownership and clarity that uh, in terms of your vision, in terms of your goals. Um, and last, but by no means the least, no, no means least, it's that what I mentioned at the start, that asset management is a journey, not a destination. For instance, many organizations uh, I've seen, they say, we have achieved ISO 55K. Wow, I have done my job, finished. It's not the case. And a lot of, obviously, there is this knowledge now that it is a journey. Even if you have achieved certification, even if you have achieved a certain stage in the maturity, do you, you and I both know to keep that maturity, we have to keep the continual improvement uh, loop in the asset management always live, whether it is about training our people, whether it is about ensuring our processes are in check, they are still relevant, they are still valid, whether it is about uh, being open to the digital technology and innovation around us and amalgamating those things whilst making sure that the basics are right. Asset management is therefore a journey and, and, not a, and not an end. Okay, so this is the, for me, these were the five messages that said, that summarizes what a good asset management organization, good leadership, clarity of goals, common North Star, common definition and understanding of what asset management means. People are brought in together, a way of measuring benefits. And about all in my view is accepting that this is a journey and knowing where this journey is taking us to. Right. So that sets the tone for the presentation today. Now, this is what having, when I went into the forensics of it to say, actually, let's 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 try and see the practical. Let's peel the onion, as they say, and see the practical aspects of what a mature asset management organization looks like. And even if which is the left side of this slide. And even if we say we are mature, actually, what benefit does it bring? What outcomes does this allow us to achieve? So what you'll see on the left is I've articulated a few things. This is not an um, you know, there's not everything under the sky, obviously, but these are some of the few things which uh, I, I'm trying to bring to life of, uh, you know, the, the, the characteristics of a mature organization. Firstly, they make collective decisions. Now, what does that mean? So they make collective asset decisions about how do we balance cost, risk and performance. For example, organizations are often, you know, split in different divisions or directorates as you, you know, different terms for different um, different organization um, and uh, one of the things I've often noticed and you will have seen this and heard it about that many times there are silos in the organization meaning everybody's doing the right thing but what is right for their directorate what is right for their department what is right for that particular department's performance goals and whilst individually this may be good but remember asset management as we all know is not just about creating the assets not just about inspecting the assets not just about managing the assets it's doing everything in totality in the best possible way so to make asset management work each of the individual departments and directorates goals ambitions have to be aligned so they serve the common purpose and therefore they all make collective decisions whether it is about if a whole life cost is a very good example right it might be the right thing to design a certain asset in a certain way with a certain cost, with a certain risk profile. But then if we don't think about its maintainability, then what is likely to happen is that that whole life cost vision is not going to be achieved. It might become very costly to inspect or maintain it. Certain parts, certain equipments may not be available to maintain and replace it. So what happens is that despite taking the best decision from creating the asset, if it has not taken into account all the other aspects about inspection, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, what you are, because of a lack of collective asset decision, you are not able to optimize the balance of cost, risk, and performance. And ultimately, it means the more number of interventions are needed on the network, more number of times somebody has to go out and inspect the network, close the network, renew, renew that particular aspect of the asset, and therefore it affects your customer. It affects, it causes disruption. It impacts the stakeholders. So ultimately, it's a ripple effect. 
that leads to what I call, um, uh, you know, uh, you have not achieved the customer service. So if, despite taking the best decision, there are so many parts in the process that got clunky that ultimately your customer outcome was compromised. Uh, and like that's why I said the outcome is if you have got those things, you can genuinely make long term decision, which therefore gives more value for money, but also minimum managers gives the optimum whole life cost approach, collective asset decisions. Now, this might not be the case. The example I use might not be the case in another organization. It might be that that particular director is looking after it from end to end. Great. Then another example is, well, are our standards team, the teams that are setting out our technical standards, have they thought about the cost implications when defining and designing, um, you know, the minimum thresholds for intervention? Perhaps, perhaps not. And that's what I mean. So sometimes collective decisions is what I gave you an example. It's all about inspect, operate, maintain, construct, but also technical standards, also the assurance, also having the best performance and supplier arrangement in a way that we are able to exchange knowledge with the contractors and get them early involved in the design. Things like that is just to bring that to, to life, you know, that there is collective decision making. Second bit is about a good mature organization is where we have got documented and understood operating model. Now, I, I know I've heard of the operating model several times and it's, if I may say, I feel sometimes the concept of operating model can be, it's very simple, but at the same time, it can become very overly complicated depending on how it's being used. Um, so operating model in simple sense, you may already be aware. So, uh, you know, it's all about looking at the organization, the way it is set up in terms of its processes, the people, the skills, uh, the tools, the systems, and looking at the, the entirety of a matter. Now, remember I said when I was an engineer, well, I'm still an engineer, but when I was very engineering focused, I was very much interested in the asset, the safety, the performance, the outcomes, the location, the inventory, the data. But then I soon realized that when you start looking asset management in the business lens, you need to see what this asset is doing. What is the purpose of this asset within the broader context of the organization? Therefore, are there documented processes that explains how to manage the risk? Are there documented processes and guidance that explains how to do inspections in a consistent manner? Are there, expect, are there documented uh, evidence or clarity in terms of what service we expect from this asset? Um, you know, and... Do we have the right people with the right skills or do we have people with the skills we want them to gain so we have a training plan for them etc cetera, etc cetera. so started to look at it from a more organizational sense um because that allows your leadership team to start to pull certain levers to say let's if i know the overall risk profile of several assets on my network whatever that might be or in my portfolio where do i want to invest more do i want to invest more in x asset x versus asset y because that is where I'll get the highest return on investment, or that is where there is the highest risk, or do I need to actually train a lot more people around my data? Because ultimately my assets are need the right data and knowledge. So you start to build that understanding and you start to provide those uh, evidence and information to the executive team, to the leadership team, to your auditors, to your regulators, in terms of why you're making certain decisions in a certain way. And people is also super, super important within the operating model. So I'm going to tell a little bit about that. We often need to know what is it that what roles are people are playing. So are they are there some defined asset management roles in your in your organization? Or, you know, there are lots of things I hear data ninjas. OK, but data ninjas, great. But to do what? Uh, and, and I mean, don't get me wrong. I strongly believe that asset data intelligence systems are fen are super integral to asset management but they are an enabler. So we need to have the clarity of what we are using that data for. Otherwise it can be a data overkill. You have too many, too much data, but not enough knowledge. So knowing that, that sort of degree of what data are we gathering, why are we gathering, how we are assuring that data is right. And therefore who's responsible, who's ultimately accountable for that asset, for that data, for that process, <clears throat> or for getting the right investment, et cetera, et cetera. Many times there are different people throughout the life cycle of an asset. It's rarely one person. Uh, then I talk a little bit about uh, other other aspects of a mature organization are that there is an enterprise asset management system view. And I know, again, I know that enterprise asset management is used very often in the system context. So sure, I am also using it in the system context. But again, I, I would like to take this in two parts. There is an element of looking at it purely as a digital system, the architecture that is supporting the, the, the organization. Uh, 
there, there is the right data architecture that is then embedded within that system architecture. There is clarity in terms of, you know, not data flow from one part to another, connecting that with your financial system, connecting that with your, you know, uh, CRM system and getting that end to end data process working for you. Uh, one of the things I've, uh, again, you know, from my recent example at uh, the council is it, how much challenge it can provide if your asset system, your asset management system is not connected to your financial system in its complete sense. And many organizations have, uh, had, have been on journeys of transformation to reconcile the data from the asset management system to the CRM system and the financial system, especially if they are updating the financial system. Even one of that system gets updated you are in this long-term process, um, and, and rightly so, because then you got to go into all the nuances of, are we making having the right data? Do we need to collect new data? How do we ensure there is efficiency between so many systems? Because a lot of time, the, the like, you know, if you're a civil, if you're an engineer, you know, or you may even in your experience, you may have seen this, that the weakest link is where there is a joint in an asset. Similarly, a weakest link in the, processes where you have got multiple interfaces, whether it's your systems interface. So how do we make sure there's efficiency for data to flow from one system to another? How do we ensure there is a reduced duplication? And very big example of that, I, I will go through it, but one of uh, an organization where I worked, where they had a lot of data related to their drainage asset, drainage on the highway network, significant amount of data. But what had happened is because of having multiple repositories, there were duplication. So sometimes you would not, you know, sometimes obviously you would not have a clear baseline that how big is the problem? How many assets do we have? Obviously I'm exaggerating, but uh, things got clarified. But my point is that was the starting point. So the program meant that actually we need to truly recognize, but how can you go and map every single part of the network to measure its drainage asset? Drainage is a linear asset. So it runs through and through the road network. So and each drainage component is different. Types of drains are different. Their condition changes. You can go out right now on the network and after, um, I don't know about where you are, but in England, it can rain <laughs> in, in, in next week and the condition of the drains will change. You know, the, the <laughs> water levels will change. So that was a very big challenge because that was a business challenge as well as an asset challenge. Practicality of collecting data, practicality of knowing how relevant is this data going to be in two weeks time if the weather changes. So. How do we try and imbibe the collection of the data, the saving it on the system, the efficiency of the, the system and minimizing duplication in a way that we can make it more business as usual and improve it rather than one single data collection exercise, you know, things like that. So, uh, and, and then the last two is about being able to benchmark that performance. And this is another thing I, I, uh, I would say which I, which I picked from local government, they are phenomenally good at benchmarking their performance. Actually, they, they work with their peers in other local government and for whatever capability, whether it's program management capability, whether it's the way they are giving their planning permissions capability or asset management, they have a way to benchmark and say, are we better off or, or are there some work, areas of work to do, uh, you know, across our services. Um, and life cycle of the asset, and they, they, there is a term they use here in terms of best value. It's a, it's a legit, it's a proper guidance has been given by this. If you can Google it, uh, local government, local authorities, best value framework, and it is similar to what we talk about, you know, in the value for money concept. But there is a, there are broader things here. But that is a very good way of benchmarking organizations' current performance with other organizations of similar scale, similar size, similar challenges. Remember that the challenges are not just about the asset, again, but they're also about our customer base. For instance, within the local government, one of the things to keep always, it's all about the community. All the time, purpose towards the community, whether it is safeguarding them, whether it is giving them the access and availability to the road network, perhaps road network that connects to the schools, to the hospitals, to uh, leisure centers, to parks, to vulnerable users. So it's very much, uh, you know, it's very much driven uh, by the community. So therefore, benchmarking that organization's performance with limited costs and budgets often, comparing it to the services that network provides to a diverse uh, set of customers in different age groups, different vulnerabilities, different priorities, diverse set of services, hospital, schools, like I mentioned, that can become suddenly very broad. Compared, I feel compared to a strategic road network, which has, you know, key point is connectivity from point A to point B. 
yeah making sure there is minimum road closures making sure every obviously safety is at the heart of everything but i found that quite different uh, between a strategic road network and a local road network in terms of the diversity and the and, and the breadth of services and the breadth of uh, performance requirements expected from its uh, local roads yeah so benchmarking is is a key key thing because it supports the continuous improvement culture but more importantly sometimes by sharing knowledge we recognize that across our sector there is a common problem and that results to innovation that results to finding a, a, a solution to the pain point that is a common uh, challenge and we talk about that and that i believe having that um, earnesty to to continually improve it creates the culture and i think that's a fantastic way to set the culture for for embracing innovation embracing embracing to strive uh, new approaches as well and last uh, in this particular section is uh, as i mentioned that it creates that headspace and capacity to think innovatively if one person or one team is doing all the work they are bound to be you know head down working through the day to day mechanics of getting you know uh, stuff done in their business in their organization but probably being able to have that community of practice to broaden that thinking work with the wider organization create an asset management community or even with other authorities other organizations where you have benchmarked your current performance with you start to create a, a, a cohort who can bring together additional capacity and proactively plan for what comes next in the sector in terms of materials in terms of you know sustainability carbon in terms of better customer outcomes and that brings back the loop of actually we need to change certain things do we need to change our process do we need to change our standards do we need to evolve to the the increased demands and a classic example and again a project is coming to my mind impact of climate change i talked about drainage assets and i talked about uh, you know not knowing where i mean knowing having too much data about our asset data around drainage but actually not the right knowledge or intelligence about it because like i mentioned that uh, different repositories things had had duplication etc if you remember that uh, example the big factor that changed in the last decade more than ever is climate change therefore frequent flooding became uh, i'm sure I'm, i mean this is a global phenomena so um, you know frequent flooding uh very finding those hot spots of flooding on the network starts to become a pattern you can start to spot them and that allows you to look back and say right we can't go and find the data for every single drainage asset on the net i mean on the network even if we do it it will take us 6 months to get all that data and then by the time we get it it will be obsolete however if we can see a map where we see frequent flooding hot spots where there have been incidents or situations which we know are a result of our drainage assets or we know that the inspection records there suggest there has been you know some clogging of drains right we can prioritize our intervention there a little more and there it allows you to look back in your standards look back at your maintenance regime and flex it to where there is greatest need yeah so here's an example where i'm where i talked about data process organizational sense and then here thinking innovatively this is not innovation per se but thinking in a a bit more pragmatic manner uh, around how do you target your investment where there is greatest need and where it's affecting the customer the most so here's an here's an example um of that, that. another example of that about thinking innovatively is uh, on the uk in in uk there is a, i'm sure like many parts of the world there is a massive drive towards low carbon products low carbon materials sustainable materials and therefore uh, there was a discussion around you know using warm asphalt um, and as as a as a material for pavement um, design and 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 it maintains its performance uh, but actually is more environment friendly and there's a lot of research that goes into it rightly so you know the everybody's thinking hat is on the research is on you know fantastic work but it, and therefore it takes time but by doing it in a collaborative way by working with the manufacturers with the contractors with the designers and the smes uh, who are you know the uh, one of some very bright people pull them together combine knowledge what happened is that we could think innovatively while keeping the assets in the same condition same performance but try to minimize and manage the overall carbon impact whole life carbon impact alongside whole life value so obviously i have elaborated on this uh, quite a bit to bring some of those examples to life about what makes an a mature asset management organization but ultimately what is the outcome 
better customer needs, fewer interventions, sustainable outcomes, people having that continuous improvement culture by working with other authorities or with their peers, or even within the organization, broadening that through a community of practice approach. Data not for data's sake, collecting data where then we know it's going to improve efficiency, manage duplication and give us better outcomes. Um, uh, digital phenomenal uh, change and must do, but as an enabler to better decisions for asset management, seeing it within the organizational context and about all making that collective decisions on risk, cost and performance, so not operating in silos, right? So that are, are some of the more um, uh, ingredients or uh, yeah, ingredients to make a mature asset management organization. Right, let's move to the next part of the uh, masterclass about defining that common understanding and language. So one of the things I've, I've seen is different interpretations of asset management. Uh, we, we've noticed this that, uh, you know, many organizations I go and they say, we, we are, you know, we do asset management, fantastic. And if you remember earlier, I said one of the success story is that you've got a common understanding, but that's not where everybody starts from. On that journey, organization starts usually with this situation where they have different interpretations of asset management. So individually, they are all correct, but collectively, do, what is your organization's asset management uh, view? For instance, if I talk to a lot of uh, people from data and digital team, they will say, you know, for us, our organization is all about data-led asset management, informed asset management, sure. Intelligence-led asset management is another word, yeah, sure. You go and talk to our operations, you know, people uh, who are designing things, people who are inspecting, who are operating, who are creating the, the program of works. For us, asset management is all about whole life cycle asset management, sure. We go and talk to our regulators sometimes and or the, organ the part of the business that's setting the investment plan. It's all about performance-led asset management. We have to hit these six KPIs or 10 KPIs or 15 KPIs, okay? Uh, there is a part of the team that goes and secures investment uh, organization that secures investment. For us, we are the strategic asset management team. We want to get the best financial envelope for the organization and then we pass it on to our operations and then we are on to the next uh, funding cycle. Great, but actually... How do you create that sense of purpose where you all are doing the right things, but you've slightly got a different meaning to asset management, a slight different slant. So creating a common taxonomy, a common language, so that it, asset management means the same thing to everyone. And we can understand that all these aspects are important, but they're attributes of asset management, they're enablers of asset management, or they give those outcomes. But asset management is doing the right thing end to end, from creating the asset, maintaining, operating, sorry, from securing the right investment at the start, having the right policies and strategy at the start, right through to doing the right things and then measuring them at the end. And above all, assuring that we started this process from point A, it's never a linear process, but having that continual improvement and assurance that this is what we set out to do. That's the funding we got. That's what we delivered. That's the outcomes we achieved throughout this process. These are the lessons X, Y, and Z to, in to improve ourselves for the next round. And asset management and efficiency, there's a slight difference in that. Asset management is about doing the right things and efficiency is about doing them well. And often we interchange them. Often I've seen organizations interchange it that, oh, by doing asset management, we're going to bring efficiency. Yes, I'm sure you can. They are absolutely related, but they're separate. For instance, you can do all the wrong things, but they, you can do them pretty well. You can do them in the fastest possible way. You can do them the cheapest possible way. That's good, doing things efficiently, but doesn't mean you've done good asset management. Do you know, see, or you can do all the right things or asset management well, but you know the process is not lean. There are uh, there is lots of duplication. There is a lot of uh, repeat work, and therefore it's not efficient. But you can make asset management is a way of doing things efficiently, but it is not the same as efficiency or vice versa. Just because you've got an uh, excellent uh, process that is very lean doesn't mean they're all the right things, and therefore doesn't mean you will achieve your organizational outcomes. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned that we, 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 I think collectively, we as asset managers need to have a paradigm shift in the way we think. And some of us have, some of you already, you know, we're already on that journey. Some sectors and organizations are much advanced than others. We need to start to think of asset management is not just about managing the asset, aka the condition of the asset or the data about that asset or the performance of that asset. But we need to start seeing how it delivers a service. So we need to make that paradigm shift in our own mind and then through our teams and then through our organization that asset management is about delivering the desired service 
for our end user, for our customer, for our asset base. Not and sure by keeping the asset safe, by improving its condition, that is the way we are going to achieve it. That is the means to the end. But the end for asset management, the, the end goal is delivering a service. Okay. Um, I did talk about consistent narrative and communications. So people across the business know what asset management means to them, that it is, and what role they play in that part of the business. They might be related to digital, that their role might be related to enabling whole life costs. Their role might be more suited and more uh, benefiting the performance aspect of asset management, but they recognize that is part of the puzzle. End-to-end -end asset management is this whole big picture. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Now, with that, let me take you through the case study, as I had promised. Uh, and my case study for today is the one around National Highway. So a little bit about the organization. Some of you may know, some others may not. So I'm telling a little bit about the organization. So National Highways is a government-owned organization, and it may, it's responsible to create, operate, maintain, uh, and enhance England's strategic road network. So all the motorways and the e-roads. Now, Prior to this, National Highways was called Highways England. And before that, its predecessor was called Highways Agency. But they have, it's morphed in terms of what the organization, in the way it was set up and the way it, um, you know, uh, delivered these services. Uh, but fundamentally, it is the single government-owned government, government -owned organization that's responsible for all of this, right? So uh, it's, it's the single entity. And... Uh, it's got, you know, more than 4 million journeys are taken, taking place on the SRN, which is the strategic road network. And uh, it can, like it says, it although it represents only 2% of the overall England's road network, others are managed by local government and combined authorities, etc. But it carries one third of the motorway traffic. So you can imagine the capacity. You can clearly see why enhancements and extensions uh, are, are super, super important. And uh, it, therefore... Uh, these are, there's a list of all the inventory assets it maintains, but therefore it's extremely important that uh, it's, the, the network is open. The network is live. It's open to freight users, uh, heavy goods vehicles, road users like you and me, customers, etc. So it, it is a, uh, you know, it, it serves a wide array of customers. Now there are some key stakeholders, shareholders here. So sorry, key stakeholders, not shareholders. Uh, Department for Transport is the single shareholder for National Highways. So it is the organization that is providing the funding. It gives capital funding to create new assets, to renew assets, to do the enhancement. And it, it gives what we call OPEX funding, resource funding. Uh, and that funding is given uh, as two separate parts. It's given as a five-year road investment period. Currently, National Highways is in its road period two, RIS two. And it's going to start its RIS three, third road period from 25, 2025. Okay, and uh, therefore, on the basis of that, it has created it has a set, set of performance framework, and there are for road period two, there are six KPIs that the organization is measured against. Now, that's one body. The other body is the Office of Rail and Road, which is the monitoring organization. So, although ORR is a regulator, as far as high, national highways is concerned, it acts as a monitor, and they are responsible to make sure that that the organization meets two things. One, the license that was set out between, uh, you know, the, the DFT and ORR and NH, which is a contract with the government. So it requires that it operates and maintains the road network. It applies the principles of ISO 55K. Now, the word was very clear in the license. It is not about being compliant to ISO. It was about being consistent with ISO 55K. Okay. And that it maintains and updates its asset management strategy regularly and that it adopts a whole life Cost approach to decision making. So these things are set in the license and it's a part. So irrespective of which uh, road period it is, what funding it is, the, the ethos of National Highways, it will follow the principles of good asset management and, and whole life cost approach, etc. Right. And therefore, it ORR measures those six KPIs, but also measures its efficiency and therefore keeps checking in that how demonstrate to us how you have applied good asset management principles. What's your journey of asset management? And therefore, asset management has always been on the top, uh, you know, it's been a priority for the organization. And even more so with the with the leadership team, asset man, uh, they are calling that National Highways is an asset management organization. So there is a very strong mandate, strong leadership, strong clarity, clear vision that we are an asset management organization. We want to, for us, asset management is about achieving customer service and it's about being consistent in the way we deliver our, uh, you know, uh, our services to our end users. So every regional team of the organization strives to achieve consistency in the way they operate. Okay, fair enough. Now going 
moving on. So here's a little bit more about what that asset management vision is. I won't read them out, but you can clearly see what I was saying earlier that it has really brought that meaning uh, and, and the agenda of asset management at the forefront. I mean, one of the biggest things that, uh, you know, the leadership team is very clear and said that it is core to our business. It is what we do. We deliver a service through good asset management, you know, uh, in a safe, because safety is paramount, you know, reliable and effectively for our customers. Um, and therefore, there was a lot of communications done around it. That why is it important to us as NH? So as designers and inspectors and maintenance and, uh, you know, subject matter experts and performance reviewers, fantastic. But what does asset management mean to you? as an individual and your role in your function, how do you contribute to this big asset management picture? And why is it important for us? Because we manage assets. We are committed to delivering that approach, not just because our license says it, of course, because our license says it, but also because we have that ambition to be more matured in the way we do, be more consistent, be more customer focused, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And therefore, there were a few things that were articulated. Remember, I said one of the ingredients is to set out what does good look like for you, where you are on the journey and what would good look like. One of the things they said, what does good look like is we want to have that culture of asset management where everyone is doing asset management. Maybe it's not calling it that, but actually we know everyone knows the role they play in achieving that end goal. Uh, and having that one approach, so we don't have multiple definitions, multiple interpretations. We all know this is what it means. Here's our strategy and we all play a part into it. And the right processes, standardized processes, clear controls, clear governance, et cetera, et cetera. Those were the things that were articulated as a start in terms of what does good outcomes look like for us. And therefore, what we did in the few years is we started on this journey. Now, some of these examples will bring to life how we began. Uh, we started the journey by doing a diagnostic, as many organizations do, doing a maturity assessment uh, using GFMM and ISO 55, you know, the, the, those as a starting point to say, right, where do we stand currently? Where are the areas of improvement? Uh, benchmarking with other industry examples and then understanding this is asset management operating model. This is the kind of high level RACI, uh, you know, rules, responsibilities, et cetera. Here's a long-term vision. We've had a good strategy policy. Where do we need to update it, et cetera? And setting a right programmatic governance because we wanted to move away from this improvement plan with 15, 20 things. Great, but actually, What's the sum total of the whole? So we move that plan into a programmatic footing. And this is just an indicative purpose that where we are at this point in a journey, where do we want to be in three years down, five years down the journey, defining and setting that out was super important. And I, I would always urge that organizations take a step back and just see where we are right now, where do we want to go? And therefore, what are those building blocks I need to have in place to be on that journey? Revalidate some of the improvements they are already taking place, but it's always a good idea to revalidate, yeah, that these are the right things to be doing. These are the things we should be investing our energy and our investment uh, and our funding to achieve that improved capability. Then we talked about the program. I won't talk a lot about the transformation program because it's different. Every organization will have a different set of outcomes it wants to achieve. But the thing I want to talk about is what did the program look at? And this is, you can call it a program, you can call it transformation, you can call it an improvement journey. The bottom line is this is about doing, uh, improving the maturity of asset management through series of layers. So not just here's a list of five point solutions. We're going to improve the data here. We're going to find more inspections here. We're going to get a new digital system here. Okay, but how does all this come together? So here's a, a bit of a, a diagrammatic representation of what I, you know, there are many ways to look at this, but this is one way of explaining it. So start from the top. Clarity of your asset management strategy and vision. What is the new, you know, we had a new leadership team. So, but even if it's the same leadership team, what just having a refresh, what is the ambition of the leadership team? How and where do they want to steer the ship? As they say, what is the North Star uh, for that organization in the asset management sense? Second, within the operating model lens. So here's the organizational setup within your people process system layer. Where are we currently in terms of the, the operating model to achieve that asset management vision? Where do we want to be? So where's the gap? Then one big, big, big instrumental thing was to set up the governance around it. So we set up an asset management steering group. Many organizations have similar things, but that is responsible to be the guiding mind and to keep everybody in the organization in a, in a what I call is a healthy check are we achieving the goals? Are we on still every activity we are doing throughout this journey is collectively contributing to the goal or is it actually defying it or is it going in a tangential manner? So it acts as a guiding mind, but also therefore sets a clear mandate for asset management in line with that strategy. 
having the set of processes, like I mentioned, consistent workflows, service-based process. <clears throat> what is the outcome we are going to achieve from doing our inspections from what are the workflows, what is the input, what is the output? And you all, uh, many people have many ways of writing and documenting those processes. Um, setting clarity of rules and responsibilities. Who is responsible to do what? Where does the accountability lies? Where does the responsibility lie? Asset data was a very good example. What is the governance around asset data? Um, ultimately, is it the asset owner who's responsible for the data? Is it the person setting the standards responsible for the data? Or is it a data team who's responsible for the data? And how is this not separate to the decision making? How do we make sure everything is integrated? Okay. And ultimately, how do the systems talk to each other, as I mentioned earlier, to deliver that approach and not be a standalone uh, system, which then has to interface with 15 other systems. So one of the big thing is that what I'm trying to say here is, Improvement program is looking at all of this in entirety, not just the strategy, not just the process, not just the system. It's bringing it together and seeing that the sum total of individual parts, you know, adds to the to the whole, adds to the whole outcome. And then on the basis of that, this particular program created a roadmap. There are different ways of showing a roadmap, but what it goes to show, simply put, is the work streams you're looking at. And also where you are in this year, where do you want to be in five years time, three years time, whatever the duration, and therefore measuring the benefits at each year. What gets measured gets done. Remember the first point I said about benefits and outcomes. By doing this project, by doing this activity, what is the benefit? What is the outcome? How are you better than what you were earlier in your journey? Where is this improving your customer outcome? And remember, one of the things is that patience is a virtue. We always felt this in this program that a couple of one year, you might not achieve the custom, means it's not going to directly give you a customer outcome because you've written a strategy. It doesn't mean you're going to change something on the ground immediately. The point is because you've written a strategy which talks about customer outcomes, which is then communicated to the whole organization, people are generally shifting their mindset towards this. People are getting that clarity towards this. People are being able to see a common North Star. Then that's your outcome for first year. But it is enabling the ultimate customer outcome, which you may get in the second or third year um, obviously it doesn't stop the network. It doesn't stop all the things you're doing, but I'm trying to say that we got to, it has to be incrementally moving towards the, the, the end state or the outcomes we want to achieve. Even if it doesn't, not every activity will have a direct impact on the outcome, but they may be enabling to achieve that, uh, uh, the end outcome. Okay. The bit I want to spend more time is this catalog. This is what I wanted to make it a little bit more real. So what did all this result into? What was the culmination of all of these things? And, and if I talked about it in tangible, Terms, not in terms of the, the people and the culture, sure, that's something for another another session, another day. But in terms of the actual hard uh, outputs, there was a revised asset management policy. Uh, there was a revised asset management approach. What was revised? What was different? In the new asset management strategy slash approach, there were two, three things which were different. One is we moved away from saying, you know, this is going to be about, um, uh, we started to move into the conversation about being customer focused, that asset management is how we want to improve our service to the customers. That became a very big, there was a fo increased focus on asset management uh, towards our customer service. There was clarity in terms of setting out the principles. What what are the principles that as an organization we are going to achieve through our policy and strategy? How are we going to deliver uh, our, our asset management activities and why is it important for our organization? So these things started to set out what I call is the starting point of a line of sight. Then from that, we built further. What I then did is we created asset class strategies. So I said, and this was because of the conversation and the communication with various organizational teams and people. Remember I said it's about sharing that message of what asset management means to us. So naturally it's a two-way dialogue, right? So when we are talking about the policy and the strategy, often our asset experts, be it structures, be it drainage, be it geotech, be it our operators, be it our designers in the operations team, etc., say, right, that's all great, but what does it mean for my bridges? And what does it actually mean for my drainage? And I soon realized that we need to translate these headline high level organization objectives into what does it specifically tangibly mean, mean tangibly mean for that particular asset so i said great if you're talking about uh, customer we want to be asset management focusing on the customer outcomes then what does it mean for our bridges is that we don't have unplanned closures as a result of not doing the right intervention at the right time for our asset of course, there can be unplanned, you know, unplanned things. For instance, you know, uh, user behavior, customer behavior can lead to unfortunate incidents on the network. We can't control 
all of that. But what we can control is we did have a planned approach to inspecting the structures. When we knew it needed an intervention, we were on the network. We had closed the bridge for a short time during pro by proactive asset management. And as a result, it didn't result into an unplanned erosion. And that didn't cause any disruption and community uh, impact, you know, the impact to the customers. There, that starts to become tangible or we are going to be able to prioritize, we'll prioritize our investment where there is highest risk of flooding for our drainage assets. There, it started to become objectives that were tangible for that particular asset type. Then it led to another conversation when we had achieved the asset class strategy that that's all well and great, but again, how do we do that? What does it really mean for me in terms of my inspections, in terms of how I'm creating my maintenance programs? What does it really mean to me when I'm doing a prioritization of our assets? And that led to creating the asset class handbook, where it was the practical how to guide on how are we going to, through these end-to-end -end asset management processes and workflows, how are we going to make sure that it is achieving the objective we set out to do? It is empowering and helping and guiding our uh, teams to make the right decision, you know? Uh, and, and what controls we have in place in terms of managing our risk versus managing our performance and things like that. Um, it started to break that down. Now, why is it in a V diagram? Because I think all the left part of this V is setting the vision, it's setting the approach, it's setting the how to guide. And on the right side are things that organizations do. They have life cycle plans. They do create an investment strategy because they go out and achieve that investment envelope from the funding department. Um, and then that led to that leads to ultimately the delivery of managing those assets in a consistent and efficient way. So I kind of pulled it out as a VP diagram. Everything on the left side is the vision, the what and the how. And the right side is the is actually delivering and doing the doing, as they say. Okay. And this was called the asset management catalog. The big thing I want to say is I'm sure a lot of organizations have different parts of this, all of this rather sometimes. But it's a good check to say, is there a clear line of slide, sight? The requirements that are set out in our vision, objectives, and strategy, is it sitting on the shelf? Or actually, I can physically see how they translate into what we do to our assets and how we are doing it in a consistent way if consistency is a driver, okay? Uh, that's an example here. And my last slide for today uh, is what are the key takeaway messages? Therefore, again, this is building on not just the NH experience, but overall, like I said, there, I wanted to summarize them in, in, in short that asset management is an end-to-end -end approach, end-to-end -end activity. It's not only about doing the best for inspections, doing the amazing maintenance. It's creating the best shiny asset. It's about making sure that the principles go like a golden thread end-to-end, -end, right from the time you plan an asset, you secure the investment, you design, build, engineer, inspect, monitor to the point you decommission it, if decommissioning is in the, is in the remit of that particular asset and organization. And therefore getting a single view of what does it mean to, to, to manage that asset effectively, how will we measure it is just a starting point. Uh, and like I said, it's more than just data tools and system. It's actually looking at it in the enterprise sense and the operating model sense about processes, who's responsible for what, where does the accountability lie? Are we clear of how we are going to deliver our accountability and using the potential that data and tools brings uh, as an enabler to all of that. Uh, and one of the things I've learned is that the entire organization needs to get involved. So when I was showing you the catalog earlier, I, we, one of the things, we work with the C-suites, we work with the senior executive teams to define the strategy. But before that, we did a lot of engagement to talk to the, uh, uh, you know, the teams in the, in the organization to say, what does asset management mean to you right now? And what do you think good asset management means for you? And, and defining that this is the kind of, uh, almost like a word cloud to say, this is what people believe asset management is doing right now. And this is what, it should look like and that formed the basis that feedback formed the basis of setting the strategy and policy once we had set it out it's back to communicate it to say why we opted for these vision why we opted, opted for these objectives what it's not ours it's not one single team in the organization writing it this is collectively the organization's approach to asset management so you need everyone's buy-in and it takes time and it definitely takes time uh second and uh, second last point here is that i feel that individual point solutions may work, but that is not always the, gives you the maximum results. When you look at individual solutions in a programmatic way to say collectively, how does it help us improve on the journey and transform the way we are doing asset management or simply take us from maturity A to maturity B, but doing it collectively using a programmatic approach certainly amplifies the performance, certainly amplifies the journey and it makes it more exciting as well. Uh, and last but not least, but anyway, is 
for all of this, getting the right, uh, getting absolutely the buy-in from your leadership team that endorses asset management, that sees asset management as a way of working in your organization and has a clear direction of travel is vital for success. Absolutely vital for success because it, that is what brings everyone together. That is what sets the direction of travel. That is what keeps us and, 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 and ensures that we've got that uh, mandate, that buy-in, that funding, that investment and an approach to escalate risks and issues because this is not uh, without its challenges, right? So throughout the journey, how do we escalate issues? How do we escalate those uh, risks that we find in the way? How do we make those prompt decisions? For all of this, we need that uh, executive buy-in, the leadership buy-in and their um, endorsement to, you know, crack on with that journey. So that's... Uh, it took an hour, uh, so, so I could take longer than I promised. But here you go. That is a masterclass on what good asset management a capable uh, capability looks like. Um, what are the ingredients of a matured asset management organization? Some practical examples of how to bring things to life from a strategy through to delivery. Uh, obviously, I did rush through some. I was a bit. I took a longer time on others. If there are any questions, I, I uh, you know welcome on the floor. Fantastic. Thank you, Jambi. Have a drink. Take have a have a glass of water. You definitely need it after that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Stuart, Stuart, Stuart from Melbourne Water. You put a question in the chat. Uh, do you wanna you are you okay to articulate the question? It helps if I put the micro microphone down in front of my there um, you go. mouth there you instead go. of pointing up in the sky. Um so um Melbourne Water's had sort of asset class. Uh, plans in place for ages and we were finding that they weren't really sort of um, standing us in good stead in there because the the you tend to focus your investment prioritization within the class and because we operate a water network and it operates as a network then the 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 making sure that the pipe that feeds into the treatment plant and the pipe that feeds out of the treatment plant having all of those in working order is a very important um, uh, piece because if you maintain your treatment plan really well and the pipe network isn't working very well, then why? So mm -hmm. I was wondering um, the, 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 how you deal with the sort of the overview of the, um, the performance of the road network, the route network piece in there, and then break down that prioritization into the class plans in there and make sure that the whole thing pulls together yeah. as, a, um, as an outcome. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, thank you, Stuart. That's a fantastic question. So there were two parts to this. One is there was, a, there is a, we did create a road strategy, actually, you're right, in the in the V diagram on the right side, I've written investment plans and, and route strategies came as a part of it. So across the network, there was a very macro view, uh, you know, as an eagle's view, uh, to say, actually, this is the, the headline route priorities. These are the areas, these are the schemes we are going to go forward as a route. Uh, but it, it has a lot of focus in, I'm going to say, capital projects, capital works, you know. Uh, so, But that at a macro level, that exists. That allows key investment prioritization to say that's the root strategy. However, you're absolutely right that when you start looking at asset by asset class, the investment uh, is often seen within the asset. So what I had done in the asset class strategies is to write a section for each asset. Everybody had to write and think about it. What's the interface with the other assets? So if I was giving you an example of Bridges asset class strategy, they had to, obviously they have their own objectives, but then they have to articulate where they have interfaces with other assets and therefore what other assets will need to do or should be contributing to achieve structures outcomes. Same for drainage, same for geotech. So what happened is at the end, we could see a mishmash of what I call interdependent objectives. So exactly as you said, mm. if you maintain certain part of the network, it's inter it will, uh, you know, it's a, uh, what I call domino effect, a failure of this asset will result in a domino effect to other assets. How do you minimize it is if you have shared objectives between the assets that collectively contributes to the yes. overall asset management objectives. So this is one of the things that's actually, you've reminded me of that piece of work because you, I thought this is done. And then with all the conversation, it was, oh, but we can do everything, but that can result to that failure because assets rarely, in fact, never operate in silo. <laughs> we should not operate in silo. It was about having interdependent objectives, interdependent priorities, and interdependent goals that ultimately had a clear line of sight and connection with the asset management goals, as I mentioned in the strategy. Mm -hmm. And that fed into the investment plans as well. Obviously, the goals are supposed to be ambitious, right? We cannot be 
saying very basic goals. So the goals were ambitious, but when we started making the investment plans, they were dialed down to say for this particular road investment, if we get this much funding, that's the outcome we'll achieve. If we get funding, 2x funding, we'll get that much. So we created scenarios to, to measure those outcomes in reality, you know? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, we, we've elected to go somewhat in the opposite direction around the we're trying to push the asset management plans to be effectively delivery stream pieces in there. So from um, what we sort of describe as being sort of catchment to tap approach in there. And then the investment programs that come out of that are then more um, the asset class focused in there so that um, you can get synergies across the um, across the investments. Yes. So just, just we took your matrix and did that with it effectively. Yeah. Yeah, I think it yeah. will end up that I do think that when we actually get the funding, it will because then what happens is the accountability is then not at a network level, the accountability goes at an asset level. So it will mm -hmm. be like that. I believe it will be very similar uh, in, in my uh, case as well, that ultimately the poor money will come to the structures engineers and they say, right, to achieve this, that's what schemes I'm going to create. And it will yeah. start to go from uh, it will. But that's why performance measuring and continual improvement is so important because when you measure that customer performance, there should be an across the performance where you have your root engineers, your root stewards, mm. whatever they are to say, sure, we've achieved the objectives of individual assets, but how many closures have we had as a result of unplanned interventions for the network? There have to be some measures that affects the network. And, and that's mm -hmm. where that performance outcomes become useful. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Um, folks, any other questions, comments, thoughts? No? Okay, well, I tell you what we will do right now. In your chat, you will see, I'm just putting in at the moment, if you haven't already joined, please join the mainstream community network. Uh, the session that you have just seen from Jamvi will be appearing there, I think probably from tomorrow. So if you want your colleagues or any of your people in your network to join as well and see that, then they can do. They can also visit um, all the previous events and sessions that we've had over the last 12 months and heaps and heaps of other content on there. Um, I know that some of you are already coming to the mainstream event that Jan B will be speaking at. We're over the moon to have a uh, out in August. Um, if you want any questions, have any questions about that event, please let us know, myself, uh, Laura, or any of the team, or Lisa, who's not on the call, but anyone uh, who would like to uh, to get involved and attend that. It's shaping up to be a big big event. Um, Jamvi, thank you so much for this morning, taking an early an early morning. I know that you're getting your kids organized and ready uh, for this kind of time as well. It's difficult, so I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, went really well. And uh, folks, uh, have a great rest of your Thursday, whatever you're doing. And uh, we look to, uh, to see you and speak to you very, very soon. Thanks a lot, folks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Cheers, folks. Jambi, do you want to stay on? Yeah, I'll stay on. Thanks, everyone.